This is an introduction to the Oresteia. In this slideshow, I'm going to give you some important background information, but also um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the major themes in the trilogy. And I begin this with the same quotation um, that I used on the introduction to Greek tragedy, because it seems to me to encapsulate what these three plays are about. And we'll talk about what that truth is later that they suffer into. Zeus has led us on to know the helmsman lays it down as law that we must suffer, suffer into truth. You probably remember from the introduction to Greek tragedy that Aeschylus is usually named as the father of tragedy, owing to his introduction of a second actor. But he was also at different points in his life the keeper of a vineyard and a soldier. Having fought against the Persians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE, he was painfully aware of the impact of war, though in this battle and others the Greeks were largely successful. Indeed, in Aeschylus' lifetime, he was probably more famous as a soldier than as a playwright. He won his first prize at the age of 26 in the city Dionysia and continued to be successful until his death in his late 90s. He was the only playwright whose plays continued to be performed even after his death. Aeschylus's decision to write has its own roots in myth and story. He became a playwright ostensibly after a dream visit by the god Dionysus. An orthodox writer, Aeschylus was deeply religious and had been initiated into the cult of Dem Demeter and the Eleusinian mysteries. And this was a cult so secret that scholars have uncovered few details of its worship rituals. Like those of his great contemporaries, Aeschylus's plays retold myths to probe the proper relationships of human beings to each other and to the will of the gods, which was made manifest in the civilization that offered them proper worship and followed the law. Humans were prone to violence, just as now, but the gods gave the gift of order if only humans could find the proper balance. Um, the photograph is a relief of the goddess of fertility, Demeter, who's shown with two symbols of her power that you may remember from the very first unit uh, or so in class. Um, she, had, she is holding a serpent um, and ears of corn, which is, of course, what we would call wheat, not the maize that the Native Americans gave us. The trilogy has its roots in two events that happened long before. This results in, as the chorus chants, ancient violence that longs to breed. The curse of the house of Atreus began with Tantalus, a son of Zeus, who enjoyed the favor of the gods until he decided to slay his son Pelops and feed them to them to test their omniscience. The idea being that since it was a horrible taboo to eat human flesh, they would know whether it was human or not. And they did. Only Demeter, distracted by the abduction, abduction of Persephone, ate Pelops' shoulder. As a consequence of breaking this taboo, Tantalus was thrown into the underworld, where he spent eternity standing in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree with low branches, though both food and drink remain forever tantalizingly out of reach. The gods brought his son Pelops back to life, Hephaestus replaced the bone in his mangled shoulder with ivory, but the family was cursed forever after for Tantalus's impiety. Pelops wanted to marry Hippodamia, the daughter of a king. Her father, perhaps so attached to his daughter that his feelings were more than a little creepy, had already killed 13 prospective suitors to whom he challenged to a chariot race. If they won, he would grant them his daughter's hand. If they lost, they would die. Pelops, with the aid of a servant to the king, won. The king's chariot wheels fell off. He killed the king, killed his own accomplice, and was himself cursed for his efforts. However, in his case, the curse seemed to have little effect. 
He had a number of children, the most important of whom were his two sons, the brothers Atreus and Tiestes. Atreus married Europe, and they had two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, whom you remember well from the Trojan War. Tiestes had two sons and a daughter, Pelopia. Now, again, these stories are told in various ways, and so uh, many versions have other, other children that we don't necessarily have to worry about. Uh, below is a simplified family tree that sort of shows the relationship of these characters to each other for our purposes um, of reading this play. Unfortunately, and perhaps at the instigation of the god Hermes, the two sons of Pelops quarreled. In some versions, this was because Tiestes had an affair with Atreus' wife. Atreus, the elder brother and king of Argos, then banished his brother. When Tiestes petitioned to end his exile, Atreus, apparently feeling generous, agreed to welcome him home. He had prepared a welcome banquet for his brother. But instead, he set a trap. At the end of the meal, Atreus tells his brother that he has served up the bodies of Tiestes' own son. This leaves only one, Agistus, to carry on the cycle of revenge. And of course, um, if any of your sci-fi buffs, I'm not so much, but uh, there's a, um, a version of Dune that's been modernized and Frank Herbert actually named the family in his intergalactic saga of warring families the Atreides, which is the name of the house of Atreus, the two brothers who are his sons. When we last read of the Atreides, the two sons of Atreus, Agamemnon of Argus and Menelaus of Mycenae, they had returned home from the Trojan War. Menelaus returned home with Helen, and Odysseus learned in the underworld that Agamemnon returned only to be murdered by his wife Clytemnestra. At the beginning of Agamemnon, we learn another horror story from this family. Once Agamemnon has gathered a thousand ships to sail to Troy, he asks the prophet Calchas to perform a ritual to ascertain their chance of success. In the process, Calchas angers Artemis by sacrificing a pregnant hare and her babies to Zeus's eagles. The winds are no longer in their favor, sending savage storms Artemis can only be placated by one more sacrifice, the sacrifice of Agamemnon's virgin daughter, Iphigenia. We remember that Aristotle said character is fate. We also know that Greek myths have multiple versions. In some versions of this myth, Agamemnon's behavior is so appalling that an Ephigenia and Aulus, Euripides makes her a willing victim. Then, either Euripides or someone else later ends up ending the play by having Artemis whisk her away to safety. Amanda Marcotte, a writer for Slate magazine, finds another modern retelling of this story in Game of Thrones. In a traditional tragedy, there should be a growing sense of dread as events converge, the hero should make some terrible decision that the audience can see, in retrospect, was the point of no return that leads to ruin. The story of Shireen and Stannis might as well be based on the ancient tragedy Iphigenia and Aulis by Euripides. Every beat of the Greek myth is the same as Stannis' story. The troops are stuck and starving, and the general Agamemnon must sacrifice his own daughter to turn the fates to their favor. The mother begging for mercy, the disapproving second-in-command who can do nothing to stop her, the daughter who says she will do whatever it takes to help. It's all a clear echo. Remember that we're not reading mythology in the same way we would read a 19th century novel. These are lives lived in the extremities of emotion. The chorus in Agamemnon is horrified by both crimes, the killing of a daughter for political ends and the usurpation of power by a woman to whom it does not rightly belong. Agamemnon at the time is torn. He asks, how can I stain my hands, the hands of a father with this young girl's blood as it drenches the altar? Should I desert the fleet and fail my allies? Yes, 
the sacrifice stops the storm. The blood of a virgin must be spilled. Rage craves rage. We can see in Agamemnon's conflict, Aristotle's argument that character is fate. Unlike Euripides, Aeschylus offers no deus ex machina, or machinery of the gods, to change Iphigenia's fate. But this is perhaps because her father's character, as much as Artemis, is the author of it. As the chorus goes on on page 11, and as we saw on the previous slide, Agamemnon is not wholly without choices. And as he strapped himself to the yoke of necessity, now I want you to read that line and think about that line. As he strapped himself to the yoke of necessity, his storm swept psyche veered on an impious course, impure, unholy, unsanctified. At that very moment, he changed. Now, regarding the, the slide that came before this, let's unpack that for a second. He doesn't want to kill his daughter, but he also does not want to, as he says, fail the alliance. And so once he decides, then he cannot be turned back. The chorus goes on to lament in very poignant language um, the impact that this has on Iphigenia, the daughter, and what he has to really blind himself to and ignore in order to continue in his path. Her pleading, her terrified cries of father, her pure young life counted for nothing with the chiefs. They were too hungry for war. She fell at his feet, clasping his robes, begging for mercy with heart-rending cries. He ordered her beautiful mouth to be gagged, to stifle a cry that would curse the house. The Oresteia is a trilogy of plays focusing on the return of Agamemnon to Argus following the Greek triumph over the Trojans putting the prehistorical time period of the events at roughly 1250 BCE. Aeschylus follows Homer in the Odyssey by centering Agamemnon, the first play, on the murder of Agamemnon by his wife Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus. As the first play, Agamemnon opens, a guard set on the wall to watch for the signal fires that mean Troy have been taken alludes to both his hope that Agamemnon will be returning home victorious and his fear that the king will not like what he finds there. A wife who maneuvers like a man and who has taken as a lover the king's nephew. Both have been ruling over the city the army left behind 10 years before. And I love this golden um, death mask. Um, it was um, came from Mycenae and it was once thought to be the mask of Agamemnon. Of course, many masks have been found in the interim. If Penelope is the model wife, Clytemnestra is her opposite. However, even without reading the chorus's description of Iphigenia's violent and undeserved death, our modern sympathies surely lie solidly with Clytemnestra. Why would she not have lain in wait for her husband's return home, grieving and plotting revenge? But just as the act of killing his daughter has changed Agamemnon, a decade of rule has changed his wife. The watchman says that though she's a woman, she's a woman with a man's heart. He, like the old man of the chorus, is torn between the hope that the king's return will set the house to right and terrified that Agamemnon is walking into a trap. Yet they are all too terrified of her even to warn him. What began as grief for one child has hardened in Clytemnestra into ambition and coldness toward the remaining two. Electra, though she has remained in Argos, has been treated as a slave. Orestes, the son destined by rights to take his father's place, 
has been sent away to make him less of a threat. Clytemnestra has become, by the time the play opens, what 5th century BCE Athenians hated most, a tyrant. One of the themes that runs through Greek tragedies is the concept of hubris. The great writers of tragedy, including Shakespeare about a thousand years later than Aeschylus, predate Freud in seeing that humans are unjustifiably proud. We think we can understand what is not clear, we project our own worst qualities onto others, and we insist on seeing others' motives in the worst light and our own in the best. The tragic Greeks visit the Oracle of Apollo, even as they realize that to know the future is to bring sorrow in advance. Why worry about the future when they are unlikely to decipher prophecies correctly anyway? Let the future come when it will come. Both Agamemnon and Clytemnestra commit hubris in this play. She, because she seeks to rule as if she were a man and king. He, because he refuses to realize that both his queen and his people welcome him home with conflicted feelings. He sacrificed one of their children to ambition, but they were not the only ones to make sacrifices. Even as he rides into Argus victorious, laden with riches, the chorus laments their own lost loved ones. Agamemnon returns from Troy in exchange for men, the heavy dust purified in the fire, washed by the tears of loved ones. He stows the ships with an easy cargo, ashes crammed into urns. So they lament, honoring each man in turn, all for another man's wife is whispered in secret. Aeschylus skillfully builds the suspense scene by scene. Though the watchmen and the chorus are obviously afraid, the ox is on their tongues. This creates tension when Clytemnestra rolls out the majestic red tapestry. Agamemnon is at least at some level aware of the unseemliness of treading it upon it, but she woos him. The tapestry then becomes another net in the trap she is laying. When Clytemnestra invites him down from his chariot, he tells her that she should not praise me this way. Such words should come from others. Do not pamper me like a woman. Do not bring envy on me by strewing my path with cloths. Only the gods should be honored in this way. Already the chorus has wondered how to honor Agamemnon correctly neither exceeding the limit nor falling short of due homage. Agamemnon, aware that he has come home alive and many have not, demurs one more time in praise of the need for a king, but not a tyrant, to think about the views of the populace. The voice of the people, he says, carries enormous power. Because Agamemnon is Lord Marshal of the armies, he also has the best of the spoils, including Priam's daughter Cassandra, who has the gift of prophecy. Unfortunately, because she spurned Apollo's passion, her gift is at this point a curse. She can prophesy all she likes, but no one will understand or believe her. In Agamemnon, she speaks in a strange tongue and in metaphor. As Clytemnestra slaughters her husband, Cassandra tells the old men, I see a mesh of death, a net, it shares the bed, it shares the blood. The old men tell her that they don't want prophecies here, recoiling in horror, frightened of Cassandra's reported ability to level curses. But even when she alludes clearly to Tyestes' feast and the grudge that Aegisthus holds, they seem almost deliberately obtuse, saying they cannot imagine who would murder the king, blaming her inability to speak Greek clearly. Though I love Meinick's translation of these plays, I prefer her line in another translation. Oh no, she says, I know my Greek too well. She also predicts the events of the next play in the trilogy. A woman will die for a woman for me 
and a man for a man who was wedded to woe. One um, example of how these Greek myths have influenced popular culture um, is the photograph of a band um, on the right of your slide called the House of Atreus. Um, they're a war metal band, and um, in 2015 they came out with a new um, CD called The Spear and the Igor That Follows, and there's a lot in that particular album about the Aristea. They're really pretty good um, as far the, as the musicianship is concerned. My husband said, um, did I, did I listen to the lyrics and was there anything offensive on there? And I said, honestly, I couldn't understand most of the words, so hopefully not. But I just thought you'd find that interesting. Um, I've tried to sprinkle this whole little slideshow full of those sorts of references. So what do we make of Clytemnestra's actions? She says she has hung high the vicious nets, caught my hated enemy in the inescapable trap, all the while pretending friendship. She trapped him in a vast net, tangling around him, wrapping him in a robe rich and evil, and accuses the chorus so eager to condemn her of being hypocrites. However, Clytemnestra herself also relinquishes any claim to the high moral ground because her bloodthirstiness does not stop there. Having embarked on her bloody course, in a fit of jealousy, she also kills Cassandra, a no-thing, a slave who has even less agency than a well-behaved and faithful queen in this society. While the chorus feels compassion for the girl, Clytemnestra slut shames her, accusing her of having seduced not only Agamemnon, but the Greeks who burned her city to the ground and killed everyone she loved. Clytemnestra says, there she lies, his prize won by the spear, his prophetess and prostitute, his faithful fortune-telling bedmate. And how many sailors' benches must she have lain on? One thing I love about Greek tragedy is that even in an ancient ritualistic play, the characters really do elicit our compassion. Unlike Ovid, whose characters are flat, these are characters with whom we can identify. Cassandra says she has been laughed at by friends, a vagrant going door to door, enduring the names. But now the prophet has finished with his prophetess and has brought me here to meet my death. A priestess who defied Apollo, in the end, she was torn from the altar, raped by the Greek warrior Ajax, taken as a spear prize, but before she is led away to be executed, she has one last prophecy to make. I will not die ignored by the gods, for there will come another to extract vengeance. He will kill his mother and avenge his murdered father. An exile, a wanderer, estranged from his homeland, for the gods have sworn a great oath that his father's butchered corpse will pull him home. Their plan of success, Agistus celebrates. He has finally avenged the murder of his brothers and the betrayal of his father. Seeing Agamemnon lying tangled in the nets of justice, he rejoices and, like the queen, honors the old goddesses of vengeance, the Furies, who do not rest until blood crimes are repaid by blood. But the chorus of old men has one last charge to lay against him. Why did he not kill the man himself? Agistus answers, because the deception was clearly a woman's work. I was a suspect, an enemy known of old. So in other words, Agistus did not confront his enemy face to face as Agamemnon and the warriors who followed him to Troy did. A coward without honor, he
He's fit only to rule as a tyrant over old men who can only hope for a new champion, Agamemnon's heir. This in turn robs them of their honor. What honor is there in serving a coward? Orestes, however, will not come in honor of the Furies, though he is right to fear them. He will be sent home by the Olympian god of light and reason, Apollo. And this will change everything.